Welcome to the uh, World Humanitarian Forum. Um, the goal today was to have an a informal conversation about some of the key challenges we've all experienced in different parts of the world uh, in our respective jobs and uh, perhaps to examine some of the lessons that we've learned both as individuals working on the front line as well as working within system um, and and uh, how best do we uh, both understand those lessons uh, uh, frame them as opportunities for improving public health and humanitarian assistance as well as uh, think more deeply about how do we prepare for the ongoing waves of this pandemic and, and future disasters like it um, my name is Paul Barish. I'm a, a physician from um, from the U.S. and do a lot of work in uh, in Africa and Asia. Um, I'm a professor um, in Tanzania um, in Dar es Salaam at the main university um, at, in Muhali, as well as uh, in Pakistan in Islamabad. Um, and my roles in those organizations have been to work with learners as well as with management to help in incorporate public health lessons. Um, particularly around introducing safety and quality practices and evaluating those practices. So welcome to all of you. Perhaps we'll start by uh, inviting you, Christina, to introduce yourself briefly, and then I'm going to invite Vanessa, and then we'll start with a question. So Christina, please, over to you. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure joining you uh, today at the, the World Humanitarian Forum. Um, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm Christina Parsons Perez, and I'm the Capacity Development Director at the NCD Alliance. We are a global nonprofit organization with a network of member organizations across the world, and we work on advocacy and accountability for NCD prevention and control um, the capacity development that work that that we do um, is really about supporting and strengthening civil society particularly at the national and regional level um, supporting those advocacy efforts on um, NCDs so glad to join you today thank you Christina Vanessa hi everybody um, sorry for Technical issues. Vanessa Pevedi, I work for the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations, IFPMA in Geneva. Um, so we are effectively the, the sort of trade association for what would be traditionally known as Big Pharma. Um, and we have official relations with the World Health Organization, as I probably said already. Um, I work on the global health policy side, which covers a whole raft of different issues from universal health coverage through to non-communicable disease policy and advocacy and also looking at neglected tropical diseases um, and pandemic preparedness. So really a whole range of different issues that we deal with within the global health uh, remit within IFPMA. So delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, and again, apologies to everybody for our tardiness and technical aspects. We have a third panelist, uh, Alberta uh, Freeman, who's a, who's a nurse aide, uh, in, in, uh, and we're waiting for her to connect. I know she's been in the system, so she might join us with her phone and we'll introduce her when she arrives. Christina, perhaps I'll start with you. Um, there's so much to talk about uh, given the last year, but um, when you think about all the challenges, the illness and suffering that, that's uh, been rampant around the world with over 3 million deaths and, um, and tens of millions of people that have been infected and lives that have been disrupted, I wonder if you could share one key thing that you feel um, that somehow our systems have missed and can best incorporate as we go forward uh, and particularly focusing on uh, implications for um, for public health, for humanitarian assistance. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I, I think maybe I'll start with this um, realization, and the the realization is that um, now over, over a year into into COVID, it is clear that we are dealing with a syndemic. And what I mean by that is a colliding of pandemics with deadly uh, and debilitating effect. So we have COVID, an acute pandemic, on top of a chronic pandemic of non-communicable diseases, and they um, exacerbate the adverse effects of, of, each, of each other. What is extremely concerning is that these conditions, COVID, non-communicable diseases, are clustering and they're clustering according to patterns of very deeply embedded social and economic inequalities in our 
societies. And so I think what this means is that this kind of syndemic nature of an acute pandemic with a more chronic pandemic of, of non-communicable diseases means that we need a, a, a nuanced approach to um, protect the health of our communities. So just to illustrate this, this point of the colliding pandemics, uh, a quarter of the world um, lives with chronic illnesses. And what we mean by this are things like heart disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, dementia, and, and so on. And, and people, it's been people and people living with non-communicable diseases have really been at the epicenter of the COVID pandemic uh, we know that the 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 majority of the deaths from covid have occurred in people living with uh, what has often been called in the the media underlying health conditions and and by these most commonly these have been hypertension cardiovascular disease obesity and diabetes um, and so what the the pandemic the covid pandemic has really shown us is I hope it has shown us that this this really has to be a wake up call uh, for governments for us to 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 for to, to realize the the importance of investing in the health of their um, populations uh, with regards to to impact. You know, obviously we've seen um, you know COVID also resulting in very severe disruptions to essential um, health services for non-communicable diseases with serious um, consequences. But I think what, what I would like to, to emphasize is this moment of kind of realization that out of crises come opportunities and that we really do need to see this as a wake-up call. Uh, the current level of investment in non-communicable diseases is pitiful, to be frank. Um, they represent over 70% of global mortality, and yet they get less than 2% of overall global health funding. And so this is something that we really need to change. And maybe we can discuss a little bit more about what this can look like. But just very briefly, this is really about investing in prevention and what we know works. And what we know is also cost effective and that works across the world, including low middle income countries, but also investing in access to, to health. Thanks, Vaughn. Bon. Yeah, Christina, great points. And, uh, and of course, you know, these lessons apply both to low middle and, and high income countries. And, uh, you know, we tend to think about this as problems in, um, in low or middle income countries. And yet, as you said, uh, in high-income countries, the people that have suffered the most have been those with, um, with comorbid illnesses, um, with diabetes, hypertension, uh, previous uh, immune suppressive illnesses. So these are lessons, I think, that are hugely important about our uh, underfunded um, in, in investment in those aspects. Vanessa, from your perspective, when you think about the implications on systems and public health infrastructures and, and policy making and and the resources that leaders need in order to mobilize in response to the pandemic. Uh, what has been your um, your one takeaway lesson that you think uh, could be applied more fully in the environment that you work in? What would that be? Oh, that's a really tricky question. Thanks, Paul. I mean, I was just listening to what Christina said, and I couldn't agree more. I think what we've seen through the various discussions we've had at IPMA is that the governments are clearly struggling to grapple with the different issues that are happening and in terms of investments in health and you know covid clearly for some for many has gone on for much longer than would have been anticipated and we see that it's most likely going to be endemic or, or as christina put it syndemic so i think you know it definitely for me underscored the the resilience factor the, the need to invest much more in primary health care and kind of chronic disease management because you know with a resilient population having seen the the clear comorbidities between COVID and, and, and chronic diseases, I think it's become really obvious that investment, you know, at, at the sort of NCD level, despite it being unsexy, as we know, you know, uh, over the last few years and decades is really quite critical. Um, so I, I think, you know, seeing, starting to put, put, put the pieces together, join the dots and, and invest more in kind of chronic disease management within universal health coverage is going to be quite a critical factor for sort of addressing the next next pandemic. So we are looking at that when we talk about pandemic preparedness within the industry, indeed health system strengthening 
you know, it, it's something that's been heard time and time again, but it's really quite important. And I think we need to collectively do a really good job at, at connecting all those issues and, and helping, you know, governments to understand the kinds of investments that are, are going to be needed for, for tackling the, the next pandemic much more effectively. Goodness, I'm glad you raised the health system strengthening and resilience. You know, one of the emerging phenomena which uh, several have highlighted, um, including uh, Bill Hazeltine, about the fact that as we focus appropriately on, on COVID, um, many uh, governments and organizations have sort of taken their ball, uh, taken their eyes off, off the ball of other um, infectious well-known diseases like measles and polio. Um, and I'm curious, Christina, from your vantage point, when you think about um, how to balance multiple, if you will, pandemics uh, uh, simultaneously, which is COVID, as well as all the other underlying challenges that we've gotten better in over the last decade, but, but there's clear uh, messaging and, and data that we're, we're falling behind. What, what types of lessons um, do we need to help um, um, governments think through as they prioritize um, and balance resources? Thank you for that for that uh, question, Paul. Um, and um, I think I think what the what's what the COVID. Uh, I, I, so I, I would say that the first the first point in response would be about seeing um, investment in about basically seeing uh, expenditure on on uh, health as an investment and not a cost. Uh, so this notion that you're not just investing in health, you're investing in quality of life and the, and the economy. Um, and with, um, I, I think with, with regards to um, investment on NCDs, this, this in non-communicable diseases, that idea of, you know, uh, um, make sure you're investing in, in prevention and access, really kind of making the point that, that, that there is a return on investment that investment significantly um, um, that this is going to significantly outweigh the the return on investment is going to significantly outweigh the cost we know that for every dollar that you invest in non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries that there's going to be a return to society of at least seven dollars in increased employment productivity and longer life um, and so what this means is that we've got to see leadership and investment in prevention and so this means really looking at those public health policies that we know work that foster healthy environments um, and I, I think there's also you know the, a discussion to be had here which is I think we touched upon it at the beginning which is you know kind of tackling those upstream determinants of health be it social determinants of health commercial determinants of health those kind of systemic causes of of inequality and really kind of picking up on Vanessa's point of the opportunity at hand here to invest in health systems, particularly at primary health care level. So really that essential point of universal health coverage. Um, and I think what we've really seen amplified in the last year is this notion of um, notions of, of multimorbidity that people are often living with more than one condition we're seeing COVID an acute condition now and we are hearing more and more about long COVID so an acute infectious disease that has this kind of you know chronic element to it and so I think this really kind of emphasizes that we really need to be moving past kind of silos in the way that our health systems are structured and so looking at universal health coverage primary health care investing in this and really kind of seeing this i think we as a community are seeing this um you know really kind of blurring between you know kind of infectious disease and and non-communicable disease and there's so many opportunities there for us to be integrating services with hiv tuberculosis i know that the who actually has an open consultation right now on implementation guidance on integration um, of ncds with other health conditions and i think that these are all extremely important in, in when we think about you know kind of building resilience and recovery how do we make sure that our health systems are fit for purpose going forward it's interesting christina that um We've had a lot of experience with HIV AIDS now over 35 years, and, and we know that people that get infected 
people with AIDS have underlying conditions that have a much more challenging time. And, and, and again, now we're hit with a new pandemic and the sense that somehow COVID is unrelated to what has been happening before um, it is a common refrain in which we tend to forget that when pandemics like COVID burst out, they tend to amplify the underlying problems and challenges and, and resilience and population health and the ability to communicate effectively and, and to meaningfully talk about what actually influences uh, populations. Um, Vanessa, when you, when you think about how these crises um, are obviously very challenging, um, and now going into the 18th month around the world, um, what comes to mind from your perspective on opportunities for learning, so things that perhaps have emerged as, as, uh, as opportunities, uh, perhaps a silver lining of sorts um, that's emerged uh, from the pandemic and things that we can um, use to help address them. Of the challenges that Christina addressed and spoke to. Yeah, no, great question. And I mean, I think firstly, just to reiterate what Christina said about the call to action. I mean, every every crisis can be turned into an opportunity depending on which way you look at it. And for sure, you know, at least with respect to NCDs and chronic diseases, there's definitely that kind of wake up call that I think has to come. You know, it's, it's a really tough one, but we needed something like this almost to kind of get get countries to wake up to the fact that there's more investment that needs to be made in tackling some of these underlying conditions. So that's one thing I would kind of call a sort of opportunity. The other is, uh, couldn't agree more with what Christina said about integrated health service delivery. I mean, I think we need to be a bit more, we just need to be more innovative and in thinking, you know, much more about how we can sort of tackle many, many things at the same time, kill several birds with one stone, you know, how do you sort of get, um, deliver services for different disease areas? So I'm kind of thinking, so there have been cases of like vitamin A supplementation, deworming, I mean, all coming at the same time as vaccination. Can we couple, can we package, you know, services at the same time? In cancer, it's, it's also been looked at when you kind of see sort of the breast cancer, cervical cancer screening. I mean, I think in rural areas, there's been a real push to sort of package all of this at the same time to try and reach populations that are quite um, hard to reach. So can we, can we apply some of those learnings on a more kind of concerted level? And then, you know, I think there have been a, another bunch of opportunities in terms of the use of telemedicine and, and sort of home-based services, which have really kind of come, made such a huge difference, particularly in COVID over the last year or so, whether, regardless of which income setting you are in, I think technology has played quite a, quite a significant role and we should look into how to better leverage that. Um, and then lastly, on the R&D side, I mean, just wanted to mention, you know, of course, this is some thing that's uh, for discussion, but the, the mRNA breakthrough for some of the vaccines, I mean, hopefully we can see that mRNA can then be, that technology can be applied to other disease areas and cancer and autoimmune diseases come to mind there. So I hope that we can basically use this as, as a sort of, as you say, Paul, uh, a, a means to reflect and, and figure out what the opportunities are and kind of think very innovatively about taking those lessons forward and turning them into some, some wins for us. Yeah, I mean, what's amazing, um, there are many, I, I think, opportunities there, if you mentioned, Vanessa. One of the things that I spend some time in is the issue of telehealth and digital health. And what's remarkable in um, both in Tanzania and Pakistan is has been an incredible increased support by government in supporting uh, uh, remote digital uh, access. Um, uh, that, that doesn't replace uh, face, -to face access, but at least it mitigates and supports a, a broader ability to bring expert skills to distant areas. Um, I think we're all learning about the, the, the power of digital health, some of the challenges as well as the opportunities, but the increase, for example, in a lot of countries has been in thousands of percent increase um, from nearly, you know, in its single digits to now um, the early months of the pandemic being as high as 50 to 80 percent. Um, one of the things I was hoping, uh, one of our, our third panelists, um, uh, from Monrovia, I was hoping that uh, we would be able to get her input on this next question. Um, and, and the whole issue, of course, uh, between school closures and job loss and isolated, um, um, you know, isolation has caused both mental and physical illness to all workers. But, but uh, today we're also focusing primarily on healthcare workers. And one of the biggest problems, in addition to over 7,000 healthcare workers uh, that have died, according to Amnesty International, and perhaps as much as 800,000 have been infected by COVID, 
um, is, is the, the, the incredible, um, more, what's called moral injury and burnout. The, um, a large number of providers who on surveys and studies say that they're burnt out, they're depressed, they want to leave the healthcare profession, and how that will continue to exacerbate the access issues, primarily in, in low and middle income countries, but also in high income countries. So first to you, Christina, um, what do you think are key um, lessons um, that we can draw from this growing awareness of this, this mental health, uh, almost a, a, a parallel pandemic, um, and a new awareness to the need to focus on the wellness of uh, healthcare providers, uh, um, as well as uh, their families, um, and how can we best think about better policies to both address uh, and prevent um, going forward for, uh, to reinforce the resilience of, of the healthcare system? Thank you for this question, Paul, and I think that's a really kind of per pertinent pertinent question uh, regarding uh, mental health um, as you know kind of highlighted highlighted by the the pandemic and I'm I'm, I'm so sorry that we don't have Alberta uh, join us today as a as a frontliner to 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 share uh, you know the, the huge pressures that she will have been um, under um, to to address your your point specifically, but if I if I can, if I may on the on the point of of um, of mental health, I would I, I would like to say that um, so I, I, we have clearly been seeing a kind of a growing growing awareness um, uh, around mental health and recognition of, of mental health conditions um, in. I think one thing that I, that I wanted to share that is really kind of interesting to um, mental health was recognized in the UN high level meeting on NCDs in 2018. Mental health was officially recognized as part of the NCD agenda. And so it was in, in 2018 that we see this kind of global um, acknowledgement of the NCD agenda, um, including air pollution as a recognized risk factor, and also mental health and neurological conditions as another um, of the kind of, you know, main non-communicable um, diseases. And we have seen, and, and I think that this has really um, helped trigger impetus for uh, concerted efforts on mental health globally. And of course, this has, um, you know, hugely been been um, a focus over over last over the course of last year. So, so I know that the NCD community has been active in advocacy in this space, and I want to highlight one particular organization that is United for Global Mental Health that has been doing fantastic advocacy on mental health. And so, I think the the I think the good news that I wanted to share, Paul, is that this that 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 point of COVID being a wake up call. You know, I think this is where we are seeing some momentum with particular global policies and it, and taking the point on, on mental health. Um, there is a WHO mental, you know, mental health action plan. This was this uh, originally was put together for 2013 to 2020. Um, following uh, that high level meeting in 2018, we start to see more traction under the NCD agenda and this this um, global mental health action plan from the WHO was expanded in 2019 to reach to 2030. So that was agreed at the World Health Assembly at the time. Now, the exciting, the, what I wanted to share with you that is quite exciting is that the World Health Assembly meets again next week. So this is where we have ministers of health all over the world coming together. Um, and we are going to see at the table this particular point, the updates of the WHO Mental Health Action Plan for their approval. And what I want to highlight is that this global action plan, so this is where we have targets, indicators, all of this, this guidance from the WHO for member state approval that um, includes that includes a new target which is and this is of course you know uh, spurred by the COVID pandemic so the new target there um, is that 80 percent of countries will have a system in place for mental health and psychosocial preparedness for emergency disasters by 2030. Now obviously we're at the World Humanitarian Forum I think that this is a uh, 
huge opportunity for, for advocates taking this forward and to make sure that we see this implemented. But basically, I think that there is a, a lot there in this plan that will help guide um, country action. So, you know, building mental health services and psychosocial awareness and response capacity for resilience for future public emergencies. So I'm really, really curious to see how this is going to uh, progress over the next couple of weeks now. Yeah, Christian, I'm glad you raised the World Assembly. Um, you know, the issue of disaster readiness and preparedness has been a challenge. Every time we have a major disaster, there's a big uptick in interest and then naturally as a signal phase, there tends to be a, a loss of focus. Um, perhaps uh, one of the most lasting um, silver linings of this terrible pandemic um, is awareness that uh, preparing for disasters or pandemics tends to reinforce the overall health system wellness um, so that when these natural and, and, um, and um, non-natural disasters happen, uh, be they wars or be they pandemics, we have better systems that are able to cope with them. And that really means an incredible amount of investment um, in infrastructure, in training, and planning, um, as well as in predicting of long-term uh, unexpected challenges. One of the key issues that I, I want to ask you, Vanessa, about um, is, uh, is, is something that we've known existed in the past, but really not as much as has as, uh, as happened in, during the pandemic, and that is the, the infodemic, you know, the, the massive amount of falsehoods about drugs, um, be it hydroxychloroquine, um, or about vaccine safety, about the fact that the people who invented the vaccines, the companies, or the Gates, the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates, that you know, the falsehoods about their job is to um, implant chips in people's brains, et cetera. And so the question is, um, you know, what are the key lessons that you think, Vanessa, that we need to incorporate into training of healthcare providers, public health officials, uh, public health, uh, and, and, and just politicians? for training and supporting competencies that they can better uh, and effectively communicate these challenges in order to build the types of social trust that we've seen is needed to both um, deal with non-pharmacological interventions like distancing and masks, or in fact, to encourage vaccination. What types of trainings are needed and what types of government support is required to more effectively communicate um, um, both scientific and sound political guidance in order um, to build more cohesion um, and support uh, by publics in respective countries uh, around the world. No, it's a really good question, but I think it's 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 um, a whole landscape of different actors that need to come together on the information side. To be honest, if you look at the healthcare workers themselves, frontline workers, um, you know, it's astounding actually what percentage. I think there was a documentary released on the BBC in the UK recently, which discussed how some frontline workers, nurses, doctors themselves have serious he uh, vaccine hesitancy. So, you know, education really starts from, from the front line. And I think somehow, you know, government needs to be investing more in tackling the kinds of the doubts that may be sort of in the minds of many of the frontline workers, because it's really about leading by example, right? So I think that if, if medical professionals themselves are, are sort of doubtful about taking the vaccines, then it sort of can really trickle down and then it sort of lands us in a bit of a, a bit of a situation. So for me, that was really quite striking. And I think education cannot be underestimated, even for, for the healthcare professionals. Um, in terms of sort of vaccine hesitancy, you know, this is something that's been discussed everywhere, I'm sure. But uh, one thing, again, that's sort of come sort of come up in at least where we've been discussing these issues is that communication of science is definitely behind. I mean, I think it, the scientists have been up until recently really losing the battle in terms of getting their messages across on um, on the you know sort of the, the efficacy of vaccines and sort of tackling some of these doubts and questions and ultimately social media and sort of these very simplistic messages coming from mainstream media sources are really winning we have been winning the battle so far um, creating a, you know a great deal of confusion so I think there somehow we need to do much more to empower scientists to get their messages across in a way that really resonates with the general public um, and that helps people to understand sort of you know not just the vaccines but i would say even the social distancing measures and the, the whole the whole raft of different uh, measures that we need to take to continue to sort of protect ourselves so i think you know whether it's the frontline workers the science communicators social media companies government 
clearly we just need to kind of work together to sort of tackle some of these these issues because I think they've really the sort of false information, misinformation, disinformation, whilst we all know about it, I think um, it, we still have some way to go in terms of improving the, the situation there. And, and we're seeing that even in you know, many parts of Europe in the high income settings that that sort of skepticism is, is really in, in places you wouldn't even imagine they were. So, yeah, I mean, for me, it's definitely a concern kind of coming from where I'm, you know, sitting within the industry. And, and I hope that we can continue to sort of make some progress in that um, respect. We have a question from Fatiha saying, um, do you think this, uh, this, this pandemic, this chronic pandemic, as mentioned, is a result of lack of coordination between different organizations and countries, especially those with a poor health system, resulting to an ineffective and a slow response to this. Um, so, so yes, the kind of the, the, the root the root causes uh, of of pan of of you know our kind of colliding pandemics. If it's a lack of coordination between um, um, different between organisations between uh, countries. Uh, thank you for the question, um, Fatia. I guess I guess I would say um, I guess I just wanted to make to to touch upon three three points about the 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 gap that we see in 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 ncds um and and at the ncd alliance we've been looking very much at this you know idea of kind of bridging the gaps and there's kind of three three ones there very briefly one is the notion of of leadership um and so as i mentioned before you know there's a lot of tried and tested policies we know what works um the question is that our uh, our, our governments are, are are not not doing these, um, so I think there's an, a really important element of accountability with civil society really playing an important role. Um, ultimately, can you, can you yeah. Oh, Paul, yeah. you're back. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Sorry, so sorry. We, we we couldn't hear you. We were running yeah. out of time, so we took one of the questions so, from the from the chat. Perfect. Thank you for that. I was just going to reflect back. Alberta had said and reminded us the issue of social trust of healthcare workers. And I guess that was a time when I lost my mic. And as, as a frontline provider, um, I'd like to echo Alberta's comment that for us to succeed in the messaging as well as in the infodemic, we have to continue to support frontline workers and, and build their, their trust uh, because their lack of trust ultimately is going to undermine any access opportunities around both NCDs um, and infectious uh, diseases. So we have a few minutes left, and, and uh, I don't know how long before, before the, uh, the we get knocked out once more. So I want to uh, wrap up uh, by asking first Vanessa for some final comments and thoughts and what the listeners can take away from our experiences and what do you look for going forward um, given uh, the harrowing experiences of the last year. Thanks, Paul and, and Christina. Great job for trying to take over while we have the tech difficulties. I mean, I um, I just wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity to talk here today. I think you know every cloud comes with silver linings, and I, I hope that we can kind of convert some of the harsh lessons that we've had into sort of real forward-looking uh, policies that are going to you know kind of be game changers and and not lose. I think the other bit that really worries me is probably losing a lot of the gains that we've made, whether it's in some of the infectious disease, neglected tropical disease management, uh, measles, for example. I think, you know, global health-wise as a community, we've made so many gains over the past few decades with a lot of investment. And the worry is that by being, you know, diverting all of these resources to COVID, that we, we will reverse some of those gains and it will take us a lot longer to get back. So I think we need to be mindful of that. And, and it's a difficult balancing act, but I think it's something that we just... We really need to kind of make sure that we don't lose sight of some of the some of the other um, big big areas that need addressing. But thanks again for every everybody to, for your attention and um, nice to have been here. Thank you, Vanessa. That's a great comment, Christina. Final comment. Thank you, and uh, yes, that was a great uh, close closing remark there, uh, Vanessa. Um, I'm yes, I think I'm going to pick up on. Um, so I think as, 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 as parting remarks, I think I'm going to pick up on kind of two, two, two words, if you will, but it might be three. So accountability and community engagement. And I think on the accountability front is this idea of COVID being a, a wake up call uh, and the importance of seeing the responsibilities of our governments and kind of, you know, whole of society with regards to the health of our populations and 
communities um, and so we really need to be uh, investing in health this is not a, a cost it's, a, it's an investment um, and I think that the other one is this notion of community engagement and community participation we've seen the huge role that communities and civil society have played in the COVID response and so making sure that as we're looking to resilience and recovery that we do have the voices of communities included in decision making and this is essential to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind um, and yes thank you everyone for joining today uh, despite the technical issues thank you for moderating as well you know Vanessa I'm going to end with Alberta's comment which is let's not forget when it comes to public trust we need to uh, not forget the essential frontline healthcare workers um, they're, uh, they're the, the, so many of the heroes that have helped us get through this so again thank you uh, uh, Alberta, unfortunately, she couldn't uh, join us. Vanessa, Christina, for your wonderful and thoughtful comments. And thank you again for your time and participation.